true I was supposed to be at another lunch today, but when I heard that you were honoring Kirsten, I thought, at last, this is a chance for me to say wholesale what I have been saying retail. <laughs> um, ever since I met her, I have been an enthusiast. We are so lucky to have Kirsten Gillibrand as our senator from New York, and also and as our future. I think you know that her voting record on reproductive freedom rates 100% from the National Organization for Women, from Planned Parenthood and Emily's List, as well as NARAL. And I know you know that this human right is under maximum attack from those who would protect a fertilized egg, but not a grown-up woman. It is no less than an effort to nationalize women's bodies throughout our childbearing years, and therefore to control reproduction. I only want to add that she doesn't just vote, she organizes. For instance, she held a public rally and press conference of 100 women leaders to sound the alarm about the dangerous Stupak Amendment. Like Bella Abzug and Shirley Chisholm before her, she doesn't just hold her finger to the wind, she is the wind. But there are, are qualities that are harder to convey unless you've had the gift of being in her presence. For example, because I spend way more time campaigning outside of New York State than in, I'd only met her on paper before she became our and my senator. I still remember our first lunch as a revelation. We would start on an issue, she would intuit exactly what I was about to say, and finish it with, we can do that. And then she would get out her notebook and write down exactly what to do, and you knew it would get done. She's like a cross between a telepathic and a computer genius. <laughs> <laughs> also, I knew immediately she was very smart because I could understand every word she said. <laughs> she didn't obfuscate or talk Washingtonese. She knew, as Barbara Mikulski has always said, that you never explain an abstraction with another abstraction. <laughs> um, during the surrealism of the healthcare debate, I once or twice thought of something that perhaps it would be helpful to know. And in the midst of chaos, she was on the phone right away, once from her own kitchen with her youngest child, Henry, in her arms. This may seem like a small point, but it is a very big point. Remember when Patricia Schroeder caused such controversy by saying in Congress that she had a womb and a brain and she planned to use both? <laughs> well, there is still a maternal wall that says that the difference in pay between women with children and women without children is sometimes greater than the pay difference between women and men. That's been even more true in politics where women were told they had a choice between being a good political leader and a good mother. Kirsten has breached that wall by making clear that the qualities that make a good parent also make the best political leader, with the emphasis on parent. Her husband, Jonathan, is a real parent too. We've learned, yes, we know that women can do what men can do, but Kirsten helps us learn that men can do what women can do. <laughs> and that enriches men and enriches children. And of course, she's a pioneer for affordable childcare and for the right of families to be families with marriage equality as well as military equality. <laughs> in, in addition to being a scary smart, <laughs> She's a visionary, and she's creative. I urge you to look at her initiatives, like the Roosevelt Scholars Act, that would reward students who go into the skills needed for a modern federal government. Finally, she's there for all of us, not just for herself. On the night that she won her Senate election with 63% of the vote, she was talking to me not about her victory, 
but about the fact that for the first time in 30 years, there has been a reduction of the number of women in, in elected office and what we could do about it. She climbs the ladder in order to pull us up. And I know that as an organizer, she would want me to mention Kathy Hochul's election on May 24th. <laughs> she here? And we must, we must be concerned with that. We must understand, as she knows, that yes, we now have presence, but we still don't have power. Here is a film about Kirsten, and then you'll get the real thing. my colleagues to vote yes on preventing Planned Parenthood access to federal funds in fiscal year 2011. H. Conrad's 36 will only put an end to taxpayer subsidy of Planned Parenthood. Let's end public funding of the largest abortion provider in America. Time of the once gentleman and has expired. I think part of the anti-choice strategy is they think they'll wear people down. They'll just come at us with so many bills and so many this and so many that, that we'll have to kind of yield on some point. I guess they just haven't met Kirsten Gillibrand in the hallways of Congress yet. These bills show a heinous disregard for the health and well-being of women in America. It is a tax on all women who want access to a full range of reproductive health care. It undermines the woman's ability to make her own decisions. I first met Kirsten in the fall of 1984. It was our freshman year at Dartmouth, and she was very vivacious, constantly running around. But she had the distinction of being incredibly compassionate and into what is going Going on with people and always had a deep interest in public service. My first role model was my grandmother who as a very young woman worked in our state legislature as a secretary and for some reason she got it in her mind that she wanted to have a voice. She wanted to have a voice in public life in who was elected. Every fall she'd be working on somebody's campaign and she'd bring her grandchildren along with her and so I learned at a young age how important women's voices are, that women can make the difference, that women have a different set of priorities, and that unless we fight for those priorities, they won't be seen in the politics and the policies and the decisions that are being made. Kirsten won in her first congressional seat in a district that was strongly Republican. And throughout all of that, she remained strongly pro-choice. Senator Gillibrand, in a short time after she got to the Senate, established herself as one of the true leaders in fighting for women and reproductive rights. We are not only compadres in the battles, we're good friends too. She cares about the issue, she's smart about the issue, she's effective about the issue. This election was about the economy. So I do not understand how this Republican Congress can move from that mandate to create jobs, to create opportunity in this country towards how do we undermine women's reproductive health. She's a strong, passionate, articulate woman. And from a personal perspective, I can tell you that she is a fighter. We play squash together. And I got to tell her, she doesn't want to lose. She's a competitor, both in squash and in women's reproductive rights. What they are cutting in this bill are safety nets for poor at-risk women, for pre-cancer screenings, for prenatal care. This is a good looking crowd. Senator Gillibrand, I know about all the work she's been doing to help um, increase access to reproductive health rights for women. I think that it gives a lot of peace of mind for New York State residents to be able to know that at least the people who are speaking in our behalves are speaking up for the right thing and supporting women everywhere of all colors, races, ethnicities. If the Republican Party doesn't believe that 51% of America deserves equal rights in this country, they will have a fight from at least the people standing behind me and many, many more. We need to fight each of these battles as they arise because if we lose even one, it undermines our chances for winning the next battle. If we lose reproductive battles, how will we ever win the battle on achieving equal pay in this country? How will we ever be able to address issues that are fundamentally unfair in terms of education and access to capital? 
So every battle builds on the next battle and we cannot give up the fight for even one issue. I have been down to Washington and I have sat in her office and I see the passion that she dedicates to this issue. She's a true champion of choice. I give you our senator and our future, Kirsten Gillibrand. Thank you so much for that amazing welcome and introduction. I just want to say a moment about Gloria because uh, she certainly inspired me. In that first luncheon meeting, I was so intimidated. I thought, how could I possibly impress this woman who is largely responsible for starting the feminist movement? And this woman who, because of her passion in an era when very few women's, women spoke out, at a time when very few women had the courage to be different, to do it differently, and to demand to be heard, really sets you apart from anyone I know. So Gloria, thank you for those kind words. It means so much coming from you. And God bless you. Uh, I also want to recognize my college roommate. You did really well, Regina. That was really nice. <laughs> she should be in film. She looked really good up there. Thank you, Regina. Um, I want to recognize the leadership here, Nancy Keenan, Lorna Brett Howard, Rachel, Rachel, Raquel Levin. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your advocacy. None of us would do what we're doing today without what you're doing every single day in the trenches, building the record, getting the evidence so that we can fight the battle. Thank you so much to each of you very much. <laughs> So I'm just going to tell a little Mother's Day story um, because it occurred to me it's just the day after Mother's Day. There's probably many mothers in this room, certainly a lot of daughters. Um, but, you know, so what did I ask for Mother's Day? Did I ask for jewelry, necklace? No. I asked to sleep in, which was not given. I was, I was woken up at 6.30 a.m. with breakfast in bed. The funniest thing about the breakfast in bed, it was a cup of tea and eight raspberries. I thought, really? Just eight? That's really all I'm getting today? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess it was intended that I was going back to sleep, so I wasn't really hungry. But no, being the mother of the family, I had to make breakfast for everyone. So I did that. So after breakfast was made, at 8 o'clock, I got to go back to bed for a full hour and a half. So that was present number one. And my second present was I got to go running. And, and this was a battle because it was with my husband. I said, honey, all I want for Mother's Day is to go running. He's like, okay. <laughs> so that's what I got. So run and a sleep in. And for every mother in this room, I know how hard it is. We do the best we can do to juggle the needs of the day. But uh, it's the love and affection and caring we give to our children that matters most. So thank you for being mothers. So what I, what I want to talk about most today is the battle that we're fighting and how we're going to win it, because that's what this is all about. And I am in a room full of advocates, a room full of people who have already decided what side they're on. Everyone in this room has already made that commitment that you care, that you actually want to make a difference, that you want to be engaged, that you want to be part of that process. And that's an important and significant fact because it is not shared by women around the country today. There are so many women who are literally sitting on the sidelines, doing nothing, not engaged. They, in fact, believe that politics doesn't affect them, that how does it affect me? You know, these choice debates, these are the debates and the battles that my grandmother fought, that my mother fought. These don't relate to me. That is so far from the truth. And what your presence here today means is that you are also a role model. And do not understate this fact, because what you do by being here, by giving money to NARAL, by going to Washington, by being on the ground advocates, is you're telling everyone who knows you that you care about this issue, and you care enough about it that you're willing to write a check, that you're willing to go to Washington, that you're willing to tell people about your passion. And that is so important. You know, the video talked a little bit about how I got here. I would never have entered politics but for, that, but for the fact that my grandmother cared about it. My grandmother, through her whole life, 
Politics was her passion. It's what she did. It's what she was made of. She didn't care if she got written a negative article about in the paper. She didn't care if people criticized her. She knew that what she was doing made a difference, and it did. She engaged 50 years of women to care about who was being elected in our local community. And she made sure that people's voices were heard, that women's voices were heard, because she worked at a time when so few women had a presence in politics or in political debate. And so what you're doing is what my grandmother did for me. You're doing that for your daughter. You're doing that for her friends. You're doing that for everyone in your building, everyone you share a community with. They know that you care about this issue. So that matters. Now, there's the issue that was raised uh, by, by some fantastic public servants earlier about giving money. You must give money if you have resources because, frankly, women do not give to causes they care about on the same level of other advocacy groups. In fact, women have given about $1.5 billion a year things they care about. The next lowest group is AARP, who gave $2.5 billion to the issues they care about. So we, as a group, who have an array of issues we care about, give very little. Now, the one place we have started giving is in the choice debate, but it is not near nearly enough, so do be generous. If you have the resources, commit it to what you care about. If you don't have a lot of resources, then amplify your voice. And there are so many ways to amplify your voice. Has anyone here ever written a letter to the editor? Has anyone here ever blogged? Has everyone, anyone here ever tweeted? Well, try it. It's not hard. It's quite easy. But it's, again, amplifying your voice. You know, for those of you who have access, you know, be on television, write articles for magazines, produce do uh, documentaries, do all the things that we can do as advocates, as opinion makers, and as role models, because frankly, it is up to us. And if you think someone else is going to fight this battle for you, forget it. I was just talking to one of our amazing friends here about what she sees is going on in the women's movement. And she sees that, yes, we have a voice and we go to Washington and we do our absolute best, but all the other people are louder. They're louder about issues they care about. Their needs are being met first. They lobby more. They lobby more frequently and they lobby more effectively. So we have to change that. And NARAL is going to lead this movement. I'm telling you, the dedication and the energy and the vision and the passion in this room will make the difference. And the battle we're up against is real. You know, as I said in the video, this last election was about the economy. Everything that was talked about was how do we create jobs in this tough economy? How do we make sure small businesses have access to capital? How do we make sure that manufacturers and agriculture can live and grow again? But the Republicans, the second they got control of Congress, what did they do? An all-out assault on women's rights pervasive on every aspect, and they framed it as choice. They said, oh, this is all about abortion. We have a right to have our views on abortion. It had nothing to do with abortion. It has been illegal in this country for federal money to pay for an abortion for 30 years. It is settled law. But they like to blur the issue and confuse the issue, so they use the abortion issue as the way to defund prenatal care, pre-cancer screenings, Breast exams. They also, while they were at it, defunded early childhood education, nutrition for women and infants. Everything that women care about this, in this country has been placed on the chopping block. Everything. Do you think every woman you know knows that fact? They don't. Because most women believe politics does not relate to them. They look at politicians and they say, they're corrupt, I have nothing in common with them, these issues don't relate to me, my vote doesn't matter, my voice doesn't count. It couldn't be farther from the truth. I remember one time when Hillary Clinton spoke to an audience of uh, the Women's Leadership Forum, and I was just a young lawyer working in a law firm, and she said, decisions are made every day, and if women don't participate in those decisions, they will wake up one day and they will not like what they find. And it was a challenge not just to every woman in that room, but it was a challenge to me. And I thought, 
gosh, what can I do? What can I do to make a difference? How can I get involved? And that's what spurred me into helping candidates. I followed in my grandmother's footsteps. I raised a ton of money for Democrats, citywide, statewide, uh, presidential candidates. And eventually, I found myself to wanting to run for office. And I did, and I ran in upstate New York, where I won a very Republican congressional district. But that was just the beginning of my story. But I'm much more interested in your story. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to change the landscape we're working under? We can do so many things. You can be heard, as I said. Amplify your voice. You can be a role model. You're already doing that. You can run for office. You can run for school board. You can be a candidate yourself. You can help candidates. There are so many candidates that need your help. Kathy Hochul's election is this month. I think it's May 25th. She's running in a rep May 24th. Sorry, thank you. See, Gloria, she's always there. Um, <laughs> May 24th, let me tell you about this candidate. She's running in Chris Lee's seat. Do you know who Chris Lee is? He's the guy who emailed that photo of himself. No shirt, yeah. Okay, so, so she's running in that district. It's a very Republican district. It's been Republican for a long, a long time, but it's a three-way race, and there's a Tea Party guy in the race that's gonna take the votes away from the Republican. So if you wanna get a House seat and you wanna take back this House, Get involved in that race. It's just in a couple weeks. We can win that race. And so if you get involved, if you send money, if you literally go up there and campaign on the weekend before the election, I'm going to be there. Will you join me there? Please join me there. Those are things we can do together. Uh, the Senate is at risk. I have to say this because right now people have, have some bit of, um, uh, I guess, passivity, saying, well, you know, the senators have drawn a line in the concrete, just as uh, our wonderful fearless leader has said. We've drawn a line and said, no, none of these budgets are going to come through the Senate. None of these abrogation of women's basic reproductive freedoms are going to come through the Senate. We are determined they will not come through. But what happens if we don't have the Senate in the next election? What happens if we don't have a majority? We won't be able to stop these kinds of legislation. And so please support Senate candidates. There's six women who are up, including me. Support women candidates. They matter. Women make such a difference in Congress. I can't overstate that fact. When a woman looks at an issue, we look at it entirely different. It may be the very same issue, but we see the problems differently and we see the solutions differently. For example, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. When I look at the issue of military readiness, I look at a whole range of issues. I first see Don't Ask, Don't Tell that's wasted 16,000 personnel, 10% of our foreign language speakers, many in mission critical areas, so we go ahead and repeal that. I also see the high suicide rate, domestic violence rate, and divorce rate amongst the military coming home. What does that mean? It means they're not getting the mental health services they need or having the time to recover and, re and strengthen themselves to go back after three and four deployments. When my male colleagues talk about military readiness, they want to know how many aircraft we're building, how many aircraft carriers we're building. And while equipment is always important, so is personnel. And so I can tell you, same issue, different lens, different focus, but women being in Congress matters. We still only have 17% women, and that is a very low and concerning and depressing number. So we must do something about it. So I do hope you'll get involved in the campaign um, we are going to spend the next year focused on getting women off the sidelines. This is something I feel very passionate about. And we're going to use lots of tools to do it, and we're going to try to inspire women from all different professions, all different parts of the country. Um, and I hope you all get involved in it because it's going to make a difference. Donna Karen's going to host. She cares a lot about health care. You know, she's a designer, but what does she care about? She's worried that the health care we provide in this country treats diseases, not people. And so she wants to change how we look at health care with a holistic approach to medicine. Her goal over the next 10 years is to treat 50% of all nurses in this country in holistic medicine. It's a wonderful goal. People, people who um, also are going to participate, um, Gloria is going to be there. She's going to be part of talking about how we get women off the sidelines over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. So I hope you'll all participate. Last, and I'm just going to uh, end with this, um, I do hope you'll help my friend Gabby Giffords. And I ask particularly for her because she can't ask for herself. I went to visit Gabby a few weeks ago, and I can tell you she's a fighter. She, everything that we want in a public servant 
is embodied in that woman. She's doing physical therapy. She's doing speech therapy every single day. She can say phrases. She can't talk in paragraphs yet. But her husband took her down to Florida for his launch. She went swimming in the ocean. She ditched her wheelchair. She was walking everywhere on her own. She's an amazing woman, and she's someone we can all look up to. So I do hope you keep her in mind as you look for races all across the country. But thank you for your activism. Thank you for caring. We have to lead a new movement. This has to be a force of will that goes beyond anything we have imagined in the past, because if we do not, we will not like the landscape we find. Thank you so much.